So our final contribution today is from Charles Barclay of Marlborough College and the University of Oxford, and his title is The International Olympiad on Astronomy and Astrophysics. Okay, always a bit wary about being the last talk, and I know that the President will be waving wildly if we over, overrun. But this is rather a different talk. It's a different talk, perhaps, for this uh, meeting. It's a different talk for me. I've got no deep space images to hide behind or oscillating seismo seismology uh, uh, demonstrations. But really, this is, I suppose, a little bit more of a PR exercise. Um, I, we wanted as a, a team who have been involved here, and I have to say that it is very much a team effort, uh, and uh, thanks to all the team in, in Oxford Physics uh, for the admin that goes into this. Uh, Shandor Crook, who's my uh, co-UK team leader, uh, was hoping to be here to do a joint presentation. Um, this slot came up uh, fairly uh, at the last minute, uh, and in fact the training camp has been going on until uh, literally uh, this afternoon. So I was at the training camp for this year's team until last night, where it was actually clear to do some observations uh, but came up, and therefore uh, uh, it, it's, just, it's just me to raise the profile of what I think um, should be a really inspirational uh, endpoint for our best uh, astronomers, physicists, mathematicians, but um, academic students in this, in this country um, to go and have the most extraordinary experience. Now, it's not very, so much a personal thing, but it is a, a chance for uh, a real uh, sharing of and uh, abolition of political boundaries, uh, where everyone is working within one framework, within astronomy, uh, and I think uh, as an inspirational uh, tool, I hope that you'll see it's something that could be really very good, but it is a, it is a, new, it is a new tool. Um, so the International Olympiad on Astronomy and Astrophysics has been uh, now going since 2007, um, very much started in the, in the Far East, uh, and has been growing in number until now there are uh, about 42 countries involved. Uh, and uh, until, until, uh, until last year, until last year, uh, the, the UK wasn't involved at all. So the first was in, in Thailand. Um, different countries will host it each, each year. Uh, and usually it's been in August. And in fact, our training program that we put together uh, to start off in the UK was really on that basis. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, the host country is very dependent on the accommodation costs uh, and weather, and making those two combined can mean that it has to shift into a different uh, time of the year. So this year it was in December in India, and next year it's in November in Thailand. And therefore our trainings had to be a little bit different. Um, but basically each country is asked to put forward a team of five um, basically high school or secondary school level uh, students, so pre-university, uh, and accompanied by two team leaders and an observer. That's the sort of the typical, uh, the typical package. Uh, so the competition has spread. Uh, it's certainly not as spread as uh, we would like it to be. Um, there was uh, a connection to be made with the IAU a few years ago, um, and I hope now that also it may be possible to, uh, to liaise with the IAU and the OAD. Uh, indeed, uh, this year, just thinking about the OAD in South Africa, um, Af the African continent uh, was not represented until this year when a team from Mali uh, came to compete. Um, it is a, a highly uh, high-level competition, uh, and some of the countries involved are selecting from very, very large numbers of candidates. So at the initial entry level, there are countries that have over 100,000 at the first level to select their five. Brazil and Czechoslovakia are two. Um, and some countries offer very distinct uh, incentives for competing. So, for example, in Iran, uh, the students who make the team are, are, have free entry to the top university in Tehran. Uh, and uh, so with those sort of incentives, uh, one is really going to produce perhaps some, some really outstanding, outstanding candidates. So uh, we have been uh, thinking about the idea for a while, uh, and in 2014 uh, decided that it was time to send an observer to get a better idea of what the Olympiad involved. Um, and at that stage, we really didn't think that there was going to be a chance to put together any kind of team because we hadn't got papers in this country to prepare for the, uh, to prepare for the competition. Um, so in this country, just going back a step, what have we got in, in secondary level astronomy? Well, 
Of course, we've gotten a huge amount of enthusiasm, and it's come up at these meetings before. Um, you know, who, who doesn't know a, a, a 10 or 11-year-old who's not interested in space or dinosaurs or both? Um, and the media has, has really helped uh, uh, in the last decade in terms of raising the profile of astronomy and the Hubble Space Telescope and its images. And so we have a huge uh, wealth of enthusiasm. Within the school system, uh, astronomy is touched on at key stage two, solar system basic astronomy and key stage three, and there's a little bit in physics, actually some a uh, little bit more in the new specs that are coming out in the GCSE 9 to 1, uh, which I'll mention a little bit later. Um, but uh, in key stage four, there have always been astrophysics modules of one sort or another, uh, but nothing very uh, significant. Uh, something else I'm involved in is, is something called the extended project qualification, some of you may or I may have heard of it, um, and that is a, a, an A-level qualification where a student can do anything they want at all, uh, therefore they can do astronomy. So that is a method for a very capable student or, or even just a, a, a student who's particularly keen on an aspect of astronomy to do either something theoretical or indeed practical uh, in astronomy. But we do have uniquely in the UK um, a, a, an actual exam at secondary level, uh, and that is the GCSE in astronomy, which evolved out of the O-level uh, in astronomy. Um, when I got involved in the GCSE, there were only a few hundred, hundreds of candidates. Um, it was offered uh, to largely, I think, there were independent schools, but also sixth form colleges and adult centres. Um, the profile now is, is, is very different. Um, it's offered very much uh, to year 11, but also as a, a gifted and talented inspirational um, exam to offer to even younger year groups. Um, it has had a very rapid growth. Uh, there was a, a large input into uh, both the PR to get schools to realise that this did exist, um, but also into the support that one could offer schools through training sessions and online training, uh, and also space ambassadors going out uh, around the UK. We, we now, in fact, have two uh, chairs of educational astronomy, uh, fellows of this society. Um, and there are uh, the remote telescopes, so the Forks and the Liverpool and the uh, Bradford telescopes, also enabled schools to access the observational side of the course uh, without needing to have uh, instruments, because obviously we don't want to limit this to places that can afford uh, the instrumentation. The problem, though, of course, is the pragmatic implementation. There is a paucity, as you will know, of, of physics teachers, let alone astronomy teachers. Um, and therefore, to try and uh, support schools to offer this uh, is a limiting first step. But in general, my experience is once a school has tried it, and it may be very difficult to get it within uh, any kind of timetable, and in fact, all places I would suspect, including mine, uh, would, would start by offering astronomy outside the timetable. But once success starts to come, either for the uh, less able pupil or the unmotivated pupils who suddenly find something they're motivated in, uh, will build the numbers and people involved. So there has been a rapid growth. Um, there was an exponential growth, in fact, up to about 2010. And then with a slight change in the specification where we had to do controlled assessment, it was actually harder to manage the year. And there's been a slight plateauing. But we have 276 centres at the moment uh, with approximately 2,500 candidates. So it's still fairly small. Unlike in physics, however, there is a very significant difference in the ratio uh, of male-female ratio uh, taking the exam. So as you see there, uh, it's almost identically 40-60 uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, I thought I'd just show a few, uh, these are about as exciting my charts get, um, so a few uh, pie charts just to show that we do have some reach now uh, internationally. Um, these are in percentages, so, uh, but predominantly the UK. Um, of that 97%, uh, then uh, England is, is predominant because it is an English exam board system, um, but there are schools uh, in um, Scotland, Wales and Ireland that are, that are taking part. Um, most of the schools are co-educational because you'll see from the next slide, by far the majority of the schools are from the state sector. Um, we do have a few uh, girls only and a few boys only schools taking part. Um, so this is, I don't know if you can read it, but the, 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 the thing to look at there is, and in a sense there's perhaps a, a perception that uh, you know, it's the independent schools with a lot of money and maybe who can afford telescopes like the sort of centre where, uh, where I work um, are the ones that are going to be doing GCC astronomy, but actually uh, only the pink slice is the uh, independent sector and 70% and or so uh, uh, come from the state sector, uh, including now we have 23 that have uh, taken on academy status. Uh, which you'll see in the, 
in the bit <coughs> at, the, at the bottom. So uh, the diversity is uh, being pushed, and we're pushing out to centres where we uh, want to try and uh, get the availability of juice astronomy and try and support them. Um, the, interestingly, we have... Uh, uh, 10% or so of religious, what I would call religious schools, so um, Jewish, Islamic, um, C of E, Catholic schools. Um, uh, and then we have now um, a growing number of um, home educated uh, and special schools, special needs schools, uh, and a couple of autistic schools specifically uh, coming, on, coming on board. Um, I, I thought I'd put this up because I, I, I've also been involved in the RS200 project, um, and it is uh, the case that this, this society is really pushing outreach and pushing the need to reach out to diverse groups that aren't normally involved in astronomy. Um, there is a huge outreach potential, but uh, for any parent that uh, has a child that is, is uh, interested in, in astronomy, actually both parents and teachers and schools are very highly motivated when there's an action in exam at the end of it. Um, it's quite difficult, I find, to uh, actually get pupils, although the children and the teachers want to come up to the observatory, when I do outreach to local schools and local teachers, it's often the parents that aren't necessarily motivated to, to bring them, um, uh, unless they know there's sort of an exam at the end of it and there's some kind of tick box at the end of it. Um, so I think astronomy can do that, but what I'm saying is that we do have a method of accessing and getting astronomy in at secondary level, although it's um, at small numbers. Okay, um, so the, uh, I, I've been honoured to uh, serve two terms as the chair of the Education and Outreach Committee here at the Society um, and to develop or be part of the development of, of three awards. Um, for teachers, the, the Patrick Moore Medal, which is now in its sixth year, and as already mentioned, um, the development of the Annie Maunder Medal, with which Marek is, is going to be the first recipient. Um, and uh, if Melanie wants to talk to me later, I'm afraid I... I don't have a large collection of email correspondences to the design. And um, I, I would say that although my desire would have been to involve a fine artist to do the design and to make it exceedingly, I'm afraid the budgeting from the society um, would probably have uh, gone against that. So apologies, Marek, that we have um, what I think is still uh, a, a fine medal um, after a fine lady. And um, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to have that as an outreach medal. Um, I should also say that uh, all the top GCSC astronomers get presidential certificates, uh, the top 12 GCSC astronomers each year, and that uh, generates an enormous amount of local PR for their centres. Um, there is uh, also a hope that we may even instigate some kind of poster competition for those 12 and even have some uh, secondary school pupils uh, presenting here, possibly in a, in a poster um, outside at one of the, one of the meetings. So, let me go back to the BAAO. Um, we had this idea of sending, sending an observer, um, but we thought, okay, well, if we could find some pupils to test out the process, see if we can do it, see if we can run the process, um, could we find it? Now, we had then to look at who we already had made a, some kind of selection of, and we found three, and they were all independent school boys, um, and we selected them from the top Physics Olympiad scores. So they, they had gone through a tester, then the Round 1 Olympiad, Round 2 Olympiad, which was for the top 50 in the last lot, uh, and so we'd got down to the... Uh, to boys from the top level of the Physics Olympiad. Um, and we decided that we would take those uh, pupils out to Indonesia, and the Indonesians very kindly said we could have a reduced team and come out for a sort of a, a test run, as it were. Um, so this is what we constructed as, as a committee, um, the British Astronomy and Astrophysics Olympiad. We had the fun of designing, which is always fun, uh, the logo for the Olympiad, which is down here in the, in the corner. Um, um, but this is what we basically aim uh, to do. Uh, we wanted to have something inspirational to something to really push them on right at the top level, way beyond uh, ordinary school, school level. Um, and these are the sort of pupils we need, uh, very good problem solvers uh, above everything. Not necessarily with a large knowledge of astronomy, but with a real excitement about astronomy, because what we ended up, and certainly in this first year doing, is basically bombarding them with literature, and they had to learn astronomy within uh, a few months. Um, and when I say learn astronomy, actually the type of questions, and I, I can't give you an example of, uh, here, but I have got some papers, actually, if anyone wants to see some of the papers, um, is, is the knowledge of the sky is, is really quite uh, exceptional in terms of astronomy, observational astronomy, um, as well as being able to handle really complex um, astrophysics. Um, 
So we laid on a couple of training camps uh, in, in Oxford. Um, so Shandor Crook, we had, uh, as my co-team leader, um, we had his experience from the Olympiad. He had competed for three years for the Romanian Olympiad team. And I should say that um, some of these countries have not only incentives for joining the team, but they have a structure that goes right down through their school system. So Olympiad schools. Uh, and training systems. So in, in a very sort of British way, we were coming in uh, really at the last minute and saying, okay, we'll see what we can do in a couple of months. Um, but Shandell's experience of the Olympiad process, he was one of the top gold medal winners, so one of the top um, in, in the world. Um, he has come in and uh, his experience of the level of the questions, how to uh, get the pupils to learn, how to build them up, uh, has been absolutely in, invaluable. Uh, he tends to handle the theoretical side, and I've tried to bring the pupils on on the, uh, on the observational <coughs> side. So we went off to uh, Magalang in central Java in Indonesia, and it, it is exciting, certainly, to, to go out to these places. Um, one is uh, looked after incredibly well. These Olympiads are run along the lines of Olympics with an opening ceremony, with fireworks, and uh, at a national scale. So one is, tends to be welcomed by uh, either uh, local politicians or national politicians, uh, and uh, here we had uh, police escorts wherever we went. Um, the teams have their own uh, guides and the leaders have their own guides. Um, and I should say uh, that uh, I'm not passing a, a hat round at the end of this, and you'll be very glad to hear, but I'm going to refer to some of the financing that is going to be our issue as to how to support this. Um, but just to give you an idea that the actual uh, running of this for a, a particular nation, if you wanted to host it, um, it depending on the accommodation and where they are, uh, but we're talking of the order of $10 million plus to actually host the, uh, the actual event. Um, so we were very surprised but delighted that actually uh, we trained the students, we'd got the right sort of students uh, involved, uh, and the students gained uh, two silver medals, uh, and we came 10th overall in, in the medals table, which, which gave an enormous accolade uh, to, to us as a team from the, uh, all the other countries that were there for our sort of first, first entry point here. Um, and I, there was an article that I put in, in ANG if you want to read a little bit more about the, um, about, uh, the process. So we then had an idea we could do this, so we structured a, uh, a challenge paper, and then we decided that for the 2016 selection process, we'd still run it with a link to the British Physics Olympiad, so they would have had to have done round one of the British Physics Olympiad, um, and we then selected uh, them through another paper we designed, a BAAO competition paper, uh, then ran a training camp in March, but we were much, much better organised then, knowing where we were going. We narrowed down to six, so a team of five, you need to have a, a reserve in case of illness and, and other things. Um, we then had a further training camp uh, in Oxford in May, and then I ran two days at my observatory in, in Marlborough, the Blackett Observatory. Um, extraordinarily, we had two clear nights for those two clear days. I mean, when I organise these things, it very rarely happens. Um, and uh, we were able to observe uh, till two or three in the three in the morning, and uh, able to put them through their put them through their paces. And then we had a final training camp in Cambridge uh, in November. Um, and as you may have worked out, all these students that we'd selected, because it's now December, they've all gone to they've all gone to university. They're not now at school, uh, which is allowed within the uh, remit of the IOAA. Um, as it happened, they uh, were all at Cambridge. Uh, so it made it very easy to um, run the final training camp there. Um, so we uh, went out uh, in December to uh, India, to Bhubaneswar in Orisha province on the east coast. Amazing uh, place to go. I'd never even been to, to India, neither the pupils. In fact, all but one of the pupils had never had a curry before. So one of the things I did in Marlborough was to take them out uh, for a good old, good old British curry just to test the test their metal, that sort of thing. Anyway, of course, the curries out there were very different, and uh, it was amazing, amazing food. Um, uh, one of the pupils also had a, a nut allergy, which uh, caused us some consternation um, along the way, but we, we, we overcame that. So um, uh, we, we took them out, and uh, before that, and I should have mentioned this really, um, all the top pupils, even the ones that don't make the team, so the ones that make the selection camp, go to the Royal Society for an award ceremony, um, and here's the team that we selected uh, for, the, for India, including the reserve, uh, and they go for um, 
a reception and lunch, including their parents and teachers, uh, and they get book awards. And the uh, Royal Astronomical Society has provided each of the team and the reserve a uh, pet set of binoculars because actually one of the things we needed to do for them was to make sure they all had access to ways of finding a way around the sky. Um, and although their schools, in some cases, actually lent them instruments, uh, in one case, I think, bought an instrument, but uh, not all of them had binoculars. So we thought the most important thing was to get uh, binoculars, which were tripod-capable, <coughs> uh, um, and they then were able to use those in the team training. So that's our intention to do that on an annual basis, to make sure that they are um, able to look around the sky. Uh, so some mug shots of the, of the team um, out there. That was uh, just before the opening ceremony, I think and them staring, staring up, up at the sky. Uh, so uh, we had, uh, in this case, we, we're, we're pushing the diversity a little bit. We, we had a, a girl and, and one from state school, and the others were from, were, were from independent schools. Um, we trained right until the last minute. So you can see me there doing, uh, taking them through a projection of the celestial sphere, which luckily came up in the observational task. Uh, and uh, they, they take on these things very, very quickly. And then Shandor in the other image going through some theoretical questions. This was all in Delhi Airport while we were waiting to change, change planes to go to Bhubaneswar. So, uh, um, because once you get to the location, then uh, the students uh, are put in separate accommodation. Uh, in this case, it was about 50 miles away. Um, and uh, all their mobile devices and iPads and things are taken off, and there's no connection with the outside world at all. Uh, that rather horrified the students when we first uh, <laughs> said to them. Um, perhaps more than anything else, no, you're not, not you're going to be hammered with the most complex problems, but you're going to lose your phone. Um, and, and so there isn't any communication after that. So the training really has to be right up to the point, and then they're left to their own devices. But they do need to work in a team, and that's something we're very anxious to do, is when we select the team, we're not actually necessarily selecting five absolutely brilliant individuals if they cannot work together, because there is a team task as well. But even between the papers that they sit, which I didn't dwell on there, but there are three basic papers. There's a short observational paper. Well, I say short, it's in three rounds, and then a, a very long five-hour theory paper, and then a four-hour data analysis. But between the papers, they actually have to work together to prepare uh, for, those, for those papers. So anyway, uh, very important to, to prepare them. So this is what it sort of looks like in, inside. You, you go to a very big conference centre. So within this room, 42 different countries. It is the most extraordinary experience for me, I find, to be in a room with uh, countries that I couldn't honestly really put on a map easily, and certainly that I wouldn't have had a chance to speak to astronomers from there. So not only we come back with amazing contacts across the world, but the pupils similarly within their teams come back with contacts all, all, across, the, all across the world. Um, and uh, political boundaries are, are dropped. We're all speaking the same language of astronomy. Uh, it is rather fun, and on some occasion tries to take pictures of you know, countries talking to each other that simply wouldn't on a, on a political stage. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a very inspiring experience. Uh, and that's uh, our, our GB table, as it were. Um, the proceedings are conducted in English, although local English. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the real difficulties uh, is that we have to work very hard to translate papers. Now, not as hard as the, um, some of the other countries that have to work on very late into the night translating. Um, but there is a translation needed. And in fact, in Indonesia, um, although the meetings uh, for us, and here we are all after meetings, these meetings, the pupils work very hard, but we actually work also very hard. Meetings start at 9 in the morning. And pre each exam, so it runs on a sort of alternate basis, the pupils go off on a visit, we set the first test, they sit it, we mark it, etc. Um, but uh, on three occasions, we worked until about 3, in the, three the next morning. Um, so it, it is hard work, and I tended to get up very early in the morning uh, actually to translate uh, the local English set by the uh, local committee who set the questions into um, English. Um, so, and uh, in fact, I did a little bit of translation um, in India as well. Um, so I put this in just to uh, say that I, I'm often considered to be a bit of a, a dinosaur um, in terms of IT, uh, certainly at my college. And here I, I, I'm taking my first selfie. Um, I'm looking a bit puzzled as to why I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> but. But just to show I can. And of course, we do get a chance, as the pupils do, to go off and visit sites. And here we are at the World Heritage Site at Connacht, the, uh, the Sun Temple. Uh, and all the thing is built around astronomy, and uh, there's also be a local planetarium. Um, so just a quick glance, and if anyone wants to come and see the papers, just to give you a sort of little hint, um, I just picked up some of these 
Uh, this is just a, a start. These were the starter questions. There are a few multiple choice questions in, in the theory that then goes on for another, another five hours um, with different structured questions getting bigger and bigger. And I probably can't let this. But, but if you're at sort of Olympiad standards, I reckon you probably should have done that by now. <laughs> uh, you have to read very fast, and that's, and that's quite tricky too. Um, uh, what we try and do in the translations is to simplify some of the language a little. We can't change the wording, uh, but sometimes uh, we want to make sure that the pupils can, can read. But they do have to process quite, do have to process quite quickly. Um, anyway, answers to me on a postcard, and uh, we'll see if you're, see if you're right. Um, another observational type questions, but in fact this is in the theory, theory paper. They need to understand the motions and the timings within the celestial sphere. Uh, possibly can't necessarily read this, but you're given some lunar phases across some months at a particular date, and then you have to say and show your working and work out your errors as to what the lunar phase was at another date in another location. Um, to give you an example of, a, of, a, of an observational type question, um, when they're actually outside doing the observational round, they all have to observe individually. They have a, a student who helps them with it, um, but they actually have to, you know, for example, they'll be looking at a patch of sky, and although it may be light, they have to know what the object is at that time in that place, roughly in that patch of sky. Uh, they have to be able to draw the Messier objects uh, within a very, very small target uh, on a star map, an empty star map, so no stars but they have the RA and DEC coordinates, so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a significant knowledge. Um, some Quickly, just some topics that um, came up in the, in the theory paper show it's very sort of up-to-date with this, so the sort of topics that are there. And we were absolutely delighted. We, we thought we had a very, very good candidate, uh, and we got a gold medal coming 10th uh, in the world that were competing there, so out of the 255 best that were there, a silver, a bronze, and two honorable mentions. So everyone came away with something. 50% of those competing don't come away with anything. Uh, we were only beaten by um, those five countries, so uh, we, we felt we'd done um, okay. Um, we are, at the moment, very dependent on funding from the British Physics Olympiad, um, who themselves are sponsored by these people here. Um, and the Physics Olympiad tends to be taken by the same sort of centres, although it's got about 60,000 taking the initial rounds. In terms of those submitting and the centres that tend to do it, uh, that's across the UK, uh, it tends to be the same returning ones. And we, are, we need to push the diversity, and we want to break away and be, not break away entirely, but at least be a separate entity and, and to push the boundaries out. And then just a few figures at the end, just to show you that actually the numbers are not that large. But to give you an idea, the training camps, uh, four, three, uh, one and a half thousand. Those are the sort of things we want, but also sponsorship perhaps from colleges to, to give accommodation from free would be, would be very useful. Um, we need to fund the transport only out to the country for the IOAA um, and to fund, fund prizes. Uh, and altogether, it, it, it adds up to about 20,000 a year uh, to run this if we're going to have a national team going out to compete. Uh, with, these other, with these other countries. So 2017, my last slide, is, is in Thailand, in Phuket. Very sadly, I can't go to that. Um, and uh, these are some numbers of the pupils taking the papers. Uh, on we are Literally, I was hoping to get an email just uh, before I stood up to speak um, of, uh, well, I wouldn't have said their names necessarily, but what the selection is, but we had seven independent and four state school uh, pupils um, at the Oxford camp um, up till um, today. Um, and hopefully we'll have a good, good team uh, to head off to Thailand in November. Thank you very much. Uh, on the last topic, um, do you cover the, all the expenses for the students who might w will want to take part in the early stages? Absolutely. Or the schools or All the of parents them. Abs to pay? No, absolutely not. Absolutely knees blind. No, all the expenses. Yeah. Good. No, we, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, obviously, for this to work and be really successful, the schools all need to know about it. Um, how do you let all the schools know, and, and how do you know that all the schools know about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you've hit the nail on the head, and, and, and I've been involved with this with the GCC Astronomy, and in fact, in any area in education, you send out leaflets to all the schools, via local councils or via networks, and it simply depends on whose desk they land on. 
and most of them go in the bin, and they don't reach the right person. It is almost impossible to get messages out to school. So what one can do is to, is to raise the PR. Now, this is very early days, and this is partly a good idea to at least start here with the community, make sure people know, write in ANG. But the, the idea would now to be to write articles in the typical type of school magazines that are read, physics education or, or school science review or whatever they happen to be. Um, but it is, that, that is the key, is to get the message out, because we want schools to know this exists, and then we want to be able to support them in, in getting pupils to, to do it. <coughs> to that, um, I mean, amateur astronomical societies have a, have, a, have a strong influence with schools with outreach mm. and clubs and scouts mm. and grounds and so on. Yes. Is there anything that amateur astronomical societies can do to, to raise the profile? Uh, yes, and I think it, that's a very good point. And I think actually if they all knew about it and could help, I, mean, I should say there is a lot of involvement of universities and students and amateur astronomical societies in helping with outreach in general, certainly in the GCSE astronomy, um, and certainly when we have an individual who has made the UK team who needs to have observational experience, it would be fantastic if local astronomical societies got involved. I would be surprised if a local centre wouldn't try and involve them, but you're absolutely right in terms of getting the whole thing known about, yes, uh, it's, a, it's a good idea to, to get that message out to all of them as well. But as you see, it is very early days. We sort of wanted to make sure we could do it as, a, as an overall thing, and we weren't going to make a fool of ourselves, and, and we, we were at the right sort of level. Um, and I think the answer is that we can. Who are the judges? Um, OK. Uh, the system is, is quite complicated. The local uh, organising committee set the papers over a period of, of, of a long period of time. Um, they mark the papers. Um, the marked papers then come to us. Um, we, oh, sorry, we mark the papers as well in parallel. Um, the two then compared. And actually, perhaps one of the most critical days is the penultimate day where we have a moderation session where we have 10 minutes with every single exam setter marker uh, to argue the marks through. Um, so, uh, and then once the marks are agreed and you sign off that you're happy with the marks, I mean, hopefully there are no errors made, but sometimes people haven't seen the working or they haven't seen or interpreted. Actually, some of our pupils get answers that are better than the ones that they've produced. Um, so you have to uh, do that. And then once the marks are agreed, uh, then we, we structure the marks. And as a committee, everything is done as a committee of 42 countries. So, in fact, why these meetings go on so long? We argue over every word of every question and every mark scheme. Um, and it's done as a committee. And there is an organising committee that has a final say. OK, well, thank you very much indeed, Charles.